Okay. Well, it looks like it looks like we're live on the air. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. I'm Marianne Brewer, and I'm from In the Company of Horses. And uh, Mark Russell is with us. And Mark Russell is um, also here in America. I'm in New Jersey. Mark is down there in Tennessee. And I'm I'm thrilled to have been able to spend a little time with Mark talking about. Um, actually, I think we've just been talking about the philosophy of being with horses and spending time with horses and what that looks like and what that means. Um, so, so I'm excited that we're all here together. And uh, so, welcome, Mark. Well, thank you much. I'm excited to be here as well. It's um, amazing that we can be this close and this far away. <laughs> it sure is, and that people again from all over the world can join us, which is just. The technology today is just amazing, so I'm, I'm thrilled that we're together. So, um, Mark, I, you know, I am, I'm really curious. Um, you know, it seems, that, it seems that you're someone who's really combined the worlds of the old and the new, the classical and the art form and the natural. And um, and I'm curious if you can just say a little bit about let let's just start maybe back at um, your roots. You know, tell us a little bit about your horsemanship background. And then I know that at a certain point in time you went to go spend some time with you know the the, the you call him Master Oliveira. So I'd love to hear I'd love to hear. Well, it's a it's a long story, and I'll try to condense it. But it started out. Um, I believe my first word was horse and. Um, and I've loved horses from the minute I can remember thinking out loud. And uh, not that I was horsey in my family, but I had horse people in my background. So, um, but that's where it started. And um, every time I saw a horse, I needed to be next to it. And um, I decided to follow my love of horses right from the very beginning. And I've done, showed horses and you know, worked horses and I'm a, a journeyman horseshoer as well. So um, lots of avenues. I've worked at gallop race horses. Lots of pieces to the puzzle that um, developed who I am today. But my love of my horse is what um, kept me on the journey of, of trying to do the very best for every single horse, no matter what breed, what color, what size what saddle. It didn't make any difference to me. And so that's what has brought me to this space. Mm. So what came first? Um, your classical training in the world of dressage or your natural horsemanship training? Um, natural horsemanship training came first. I was always um, just in awe of how quickly horses could um, focus on you and learn and start to listen. And um, actually, one of my clients that I schooled horses for said I, in, um, in the late 70s, said I have a, a teacher that I think you would like to meet. And I said, uh, who would that be? And they said, Master Oliveira from Portugal. And um, that was kind of the beginning of my journey. So. Um, I rode for um, a couple of years under their tutelage, my students' tutelage, under classical work. And then Master Oliveira came to America, and they came to my farm and said, Master Oliveira is here. We'd like you to come and meet him. And I said, well, I don't really have time. And um, they said, well, finish up what you need to do, and we'll come pick you up later on. And it was a three or four day clinic and I told my help that I would be back as soon as I could and four days later I came back to the farm. So I stayed with Master Oliveira for all the time that he was here and it was a lot of fun. And then I closed up my farm and went to Portugal. So, <laughs> so that's how that transpired. I'd been, you know, doing horses all of my life up to that point. And um, then when I went to Portugal to study with Master Oliveira, that completely changed everything I thought that I knew about horses. So then I thought, well, that end of it is miraculous. The, the classical art form end of it is miraculous. But there's also the other piece of it where horses begin their journey with humans, and it can be 
a lot nicer, a lot softer for the horse because I dealt with that in the beginning. And so I started to co combine the, the entire um, effort. And for me and my horses, we're all pretty happy about it. So, so Mark, I wonder if you can just say more about that. Like, so you said that, so you had already had a, a career in horses that you had spent, you know, from the time you could speak <laughs> in mm -hmm. love with them. And then, and then you were able to, um, you know, ride horses and train horses and show horses and then you you know you've you got your natural horsemanship training and then off you went to Portugal and you said it just changed everything so can you say how so well when we when and I pretty much see it every day when I teach um, we usually do far too much for our horse to be able to develop and comprehend um, and we're in too much of a hurry and, and horses are amazing. You, we can teach them a lot in a very short time, but to develop their minds in their bodies um, in the same time frame and keep them healthy and sound physically um, and mentally sound and able to develop academically, um, they need to be emotionally and mentally um, relaxed and physically relaxed to get the best out of their developing process. So um, for me, when we when we see excellent horse people start horses in a day, it's a wonderful thing. I think they're um, um, masters at what they do, but that's what they do. And for me, I'm more interested in the longevity of my horse and the health, so I want their muscles to develop, their mind to develop, and their um, you know, physical being to develop as well. So it's a layering effect for me from the very first time I put my hands on a horse. Um, okay. Got it. So that's what changed for you then, your idea of the time frame. Time frames changed. Um, applications changed, how, how little it takes to help a horse um, stay biomechanically aligned and, and balanced, um, and how important you know, movement is for our horse, in our horse's mind, um, so they stay emotionally balanced as well. Got it. Got it. Makes sense to me. So inside of that question, because um, obviously you went over there and you, you began to really take on the study of is it classical dressage or was it dressage as an art form? And if you can just speak to what is what would you say is the difference between those those two? Uh, uh, and this is, is my take on it and it's, it's been you know discussed over many tables throughout the world. But for me, art form is, is about the horse and it's it's about softness and communication and understanding but also responsiveness and um, in in um, sport what I call sport horse riding it's more about um, just the movement and um, so I, for me I see a lot of horses get lost in the in the human involvement in um, pursuing ribbons is the best way I can say it. Not, I ride just for the horse. Mm -hmm. and so if one horse takes a month to learn something, I take a month to teach it. If the next horse that comes along takes a day to learn something, I'll show them in a day and I'll be really careful with them because they're really smart. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, it's not that I won't let them move at their space, but whatever time it takes, I'll allow that. And I don't ever take anything from the horse. The horse will always give me what they're able to give me if they're ready for it. So I don't have to take it. It it uh it reminds me of something that I read in the foreword to your book, um, uh, the foreword of uh, lessons. Mark's book, Lessons in Lightness, is written by Bettina Drummond, and Mark explained to me that that um, is is and has been Nuno Oliveira's. Uh, main student and she's been a student of his for a very long time and apparently a brilliant human being but um, she said that when she was reading your book 
uh, and the words that she was reading reminded her of our teacher, so I'm guessing that's yours and hers, and she, she said that the teacher would say that there is, there is no actual definable technique. There is only the ability of each writer to find the right measure of tact to present the question in such a way as to be acceptable to the individual needs of a particular horse. And I think that's what I hear you saying. If, it, if this horse needs this, this is where we go. If this horse got that, we move on. <laughs> it's, it's, that's it in a nutshell. And if we, the hardest part for, for humans is to learn how to ask, to what degree to ask, and what questions to ask. Because a horse can't lie to us. They cannot. They can only tell us where they are. So, yes, definitely. Definitely. And, you know, I think that, that I, when I read that, I was like, gosh, I, I wish I had said that. That's such a wonderful, <laughs> such a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful thing that someone said. Because, it, to me, that sounds like um, when we try to describe feel or we try to teach feel, mm -hmm. to, to a student, you know, human, a human right. student, it's, it's a very challenging thing because it's so dynamic, it's so complex. It's not just about touch. Right. And the other, the other piece of that is, you know, everybody's feel, everybody's timing is different. So we can teach in in my presentation. I can teach mechanics and I can teach um, responses from the horse, but I can't teach you or anybody else to feel it. They have to learn in their space and, and who they are to feel what they feel. Got it. Got it. There's a bunch of questions, Mark, and wh one of them I think that maybe um, we kind of just addressed, and um, it's from Barbara, and she... She says, in your book, you suggest vibrating the rein to induce the horse to relax and flex at his pole. And in the recent Arizona clinic, you use steady light pressure. And can you explain the difference? And I, I'm willing to bet it was probably a different situation than a different horse. It was a, that was a good bet. I would say that you won. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what happens in clinic situations is, you know, when we're working on an individual horse, in a progression, um, generally we have, you know, I'll have them from when they are introduced to humans at a, a learning scenario, training scenario, and we do um, rational progressions for the horse. When we meet a horse in a clinic, we only meet the horse and the human that comes through the door for a very short time. So, what we're trying to do is present to the horse and the human some rational developmental processes. And um, when they come in like that in a clinic scenario, you know, lots of them don't really know how to yield to the rein. Lots of them are fairly locked up and biomechanically out of alignment so their body isn't functioning to the best of the horse's ability. So I have to, like um, we spoke earlier, evaluate the whole scenario and see what I can do for each horse and each human in the timeline that I have, which is usually fairly short. So steady pressure um, will teach the horse that what I try to present is an idea that if the horse yields to pressure, then I don't have to pull on them. And if I give them enough time to understand that, um, every horse will learn it to some degree or another. When they learn to yield to the connection, then I, it would be feasible for me to layer in the release of the jaw in that scenario. But there's a lot of um, learning for the human being ahead of that. And that's where we talked about feel and tact and understanding. So if I layer that in too early, the human won't be able to ride the horse any better than when they came through the gate. <laughs> you know? So that's why I'm careful about how I layer those pieces in. Right. 
Right, so hopefully, Barbara, that answers your question, and it's kind of the answer that I thought we were going to get, because it kind of depends, right? Yes, no, maybe, sometimes, always, usually, never, I don't know, you know, like, it depends on everything that, mm -hmm. like you said, walks through the door of the clinic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every single thing is different, every horse, every human combination. And then there's another question that kind of piggybacks right on that, and it's kind of, a again, a... a a, a yes, no, maybe, always, sometimes, never kind of answer, but maybe you have something different to say. Cindy asks, um, and how should we respond if we ask a question and the horse says no? I don't understand or no, I can't do that. Well, there's a lot of depends in there as well, but, you know, if a horse says no, um, there's predominantly for me off the top of my head two reasons they don't understand the question or they've had that question presented to them in a poor way prior to so they're a bit defensive um, generally if a horse says no in that scenario um, I want to soften my request and reevaluate how I presented it to the horse I'm always willing to reevaluate and try a, a different presentation maybe a different um, position, maybe a different connection, um, but always for me softer unless it's catastrophic and, and we have to move quickly and certainly we can get in no situations that are a bit dangerous. So no situations, you have to move and do what you need to do. But if we soften and represent, um, chances are sooner or later the horse will understand more clearly what our request is. I, I like that answer too. I remember reading an article um, about a veterinarian who, you know, veterinarians notoriously don't have a lot of time when they get, get to a call. And I remember reading this article where the veterinarian, it talked about just taking a moment, just be with the horse for just a moment. Sure, you might be there five minutes longer, but just, just taking another moment, you know, to maybe make the request again so we don't have to get the twitch out or we don't have to go down the road of creating a fight. Right, right. And that's what we try to avoid at all cost when we're developing a horse. Um, because that's going to that's gonna leave an impression on our horses. And, it, and this horse or that horse, that impression may never go away. You know, we may layer over the top of it, but they may hold on to it pretty severely for a long, long time. Yeah, the question is always right. Where did the where did the brace start? Is it a brace in the mind or a brace in the body? But either way, a brace is a brace, and it's somewhere, and it's in there. And it's, it's nice if you can get it out of the body, and it. It's, I think it seems harder to get it out of the mind. Well, it's always more difficult to get it out of the mind, so we try not to put it in there. <laughs> and everybody does. I I don't know anybody that that works with horses that doesn't create, you know some braces and some bothers in some of those, you know, transitional periods of time. So um, we all do it. Um, sometimes it's less rather than more. Sometimes it's too much and we'd like to have not done that. But, you know, um, that's our journey. That's how we learn by making those mistakes and, and trying to correct them so that the mistakes get less and less and smaller and smaller. Right, and it sounds like any relationship, you know, we 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 go at it and it goes how it goes and hopefully we can apologize and fix the things that we wished we hadn't done. And you know, in my in my lifetime, and, um, I have certainly apologized to a lot of horses and they've accepted my apology, I'll put it that way. So as long as we're sincere and say, well, you know, I didn't know that was a mistake, <laughs> you know. If a horse is in the right place and we're in the right place uh, emotionally and mentally, there's no reason that the horse won't accept our apology, you know. So that's just yeah. something for you to, you know, think about apologizing to your horse. Sounds rather dumb, but it actually is viable. And and if it's honest, you know, I, I, they're gonna know, they're gonna hear it, they're gonna feel it, they're gonna, and you know, that kind of makes me wonder too, because um, you know, I know that you've also written another book called Riding with Chi, and and yeah. I'm I'm wondering if you can 
you know, speak to how your study of, of uh, the martial arts or Tai Chi or, or whatever you want to say about that has influenced your horsemanship? Uh, I, you know, I think um, when I think about that, and I, I really apply that on a daily basis, that riding with Chi is a DVD, um, but um, when we started that project, it was because I had studied Tai Chi and um, it profoundly um, changed the way I interpreted who I was and what I did. And, you know, it allowed me to find the braces in me. And when I started to think about um, the braces in me, and I thought about the mirroring of the horse to the human, and I thought, if I carry all of those braces, even to the smallest places in my body, my horse is going to find those braces and think that they need to carry those braces or some of those braces. If I'm reactive, then my horse is going to be reactive rather than responsive. And so um, the more I studied, the more, the more finite I realized our connection to the horse really was because our connection to self could be so finite. Um, and that's an ongoing journey, a lifetime journey for me with myself and my horse to refine that connection. So it is um, one of the things, it's internal um, martial arts, if you will, is really about the individual. And so it's um, learning about ourselves. And so it, it really helps us learn how we present to horses and how the horse interprets. There's a um, somebody who wants to hear um, somebody who wants to hear your best turnaround story. So a big success oh, story. Gosh, gosh, I've had um, turnaround stories. I think, you know, I'll say it this way. Um, when I um, find a, or a horse finds me, <laughs> let's put it that way, um, every horse that I salvage, every horse that I bring to a better place, every horse that I help understand when there was little understanding and I help them align when there was poor alignment and I help them gymnastically develop and then they can go on and be successful with um, someone, um, be it um, a novice rider or a professional rider, and success is a subjective term for me, if they can go home and just allow your daughter or your son to go around the yard for the rest of their life safe and happy and healthy, then that's a success. Mm -hmm. and, um, lots of horses that I get are get fairly bothered and I, I enjoy taking those horses that are a, a, a bit misinformed and a bit bothered and and redeveloping their entire understanding of human connection and that's they're all success stories they really are mm, I hear you and I, another thing that I keep hearing in your speaking is is the it you you keep speaking to over the period of time, like you, you spoke about the short period of time that is in a clinic and and um, and that some of these things takes time. There's a question there's a question from uh, from someone about um, where's that question? Um, well there's a couple of questions about horses that uh, react angrily or irritably to something we've asked and then there's a question about um, what's the best way to, um, you know, like when fear crops up in a horse, what's the best way to help the horse to change, change their mind? And they feel like, um, they feel like similar questions to me because they feel like they're kind of, go ahead, you can speak to those. I think when we, when we have those scenarios, um, sometimes um, when we have angry horses, sometimes um, they are, horses that are bred to be tough and um, 
sometimes when they're bred to be tough, to be successful at their job, and um, maybe we are a little bit too quick with what we present to them, maybe they're a little too fresh um, physically, maybe they need to move a little bit and relax. Um, those pieces are, are pieces that we can adjust. And, and I can say this, I, I've seen and reworked lots of horses that were angry, and every single one that I've reworked, um, my progression is to give them permission to move and give them permission to stand still so that they can relax. And then um, the other piece of that is every single one that I've redone has been in a place where they didn't understand and they were either bothered or, or worried about any presentation. And as soon as I gave them some academic information and showed them how to, how to be able to move and relax through their, their feet and their legs and their body um, and how to adjust their balance, every single one has gotten better. So it's usually a misunderstanding um, horses that are bred to be competitive and therefore there some of them are difficult um, and trying to teach too much too fast. Mm -hmm. So I usually back off and find out what they don't know, not what I'd like them to do. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, and the and the and the same thing is um, kind of goes for the f the fear question as well. You know, when fear comes up in a horse, um, Monica asks, "What what is the best way to begin to change the horse's mind?" You know, um, when we have a horse that's fearful, it can be from different for different reasons, but any time that I have a horse that's fearful, I actually um, want to spend time with the horse. I actually want to slow down and not really ask the horse for much of anything until they are um, sure that you're not there to um, hurt them. And that's what they're afraid of is they're, you know, somehow they're going to get hurt. And what the most important thing in training horses to me is how the horse feels about the human presentation. So if there's a fear thing in, we just have to back off a little bit and give the horse plenty of time and room. I say plenty of time. Some of those horses takes, take weeks and weeks and weeks of just being with them, just kind of letting them know who you are. Maybe, maybe we're in, in the pasture with them. Maybe we're in the arena with them. Maybe we're in the round pen with them. Maybe we're in the stall with them, depending on the scenario. Um, but horses are, you know, they want to be able to run, so to get away. So if they're real fearful, you know, I'll put them in a round pen and stand there and let them move. And when they decide that I'm not going to attack them, you know, they'll get curious. I'm not telling them they have to go anywhere. I'm not telling them they have to stay anywhere. And sooner or later, they'll get curious, and then we can start a conversation, you know. So that's some of the things about fear for me. I, I don't like fear in horses. I don't think it needs to be there. I think that um, there are ways around it. There are ways through it, as long as we consider the horse the ultimate truth, as long as we wait for the horse to tell us where we are. And, you know, that sounds like another one of those times where it is the feel. It's a, your ability to just be in the very dynamic place of feel where you can, and I, I actually call it, and, and I guess it is called social intelligence, where you're feeling together with the horse you're with or with the person you're with and you know what's happening. So it may be doing less sooner than having to do something to correct later is, is kind of the answer to that. Yes, yeah, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. And that takes, that really takes, you know, experience and, and a real solid knowledge base um, and knowing a lot of horses would be the way I would put that. Um, because they're so different and, and, you know, so much alike and so different all in one sentence. So um, that's the journey, that really is.
Yeah, I hear you. Um, there's a there's a uh, question from uh, Vanessa, and she says she's a novice writer, and she and maybe you just spoke to this actually. Uh, she says between lessons, what's the best thing I can do for my horse's happiness and well-being under saddle? Thanks. Um, I, you know, if you if you've got lessons and you've got lessons to practice, um, it's between the lessons is a, is a wonderful time to learn to communicate and listen to your horse instead of telling your horse what to do all the time. Um, being in a safe place helps that. But, you know, I have a tendency to present, you know, a question about do you understand my left leg when you're in a left bend? Do you understand how to create a left bend? Do you understand how to release to the left rein? There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things to play with without going far fast. You know? So and what we teach on the left, we have to teach on the right. So, you know, we have the right horse and the left horse. So between lessons we don't have enough time to practice our lessons and our connection with our horse. It's everything that you can think of, as long as you're thinking of your horse, we can play with. When we're, when we're between lessons, when we're riding at home. And the more our horse understands that we're trying to understand them, they'll try to understand us. Yeah, and, and also the thing, Mark, too, is about the, the ground exercises that, you know, that I know that you do and that many, yes. many people can help a horse with when you're, when you're not in the saddle. Yes, undoubtedly. Uh, and every horse, and I see it every day, every horse... Um, that I work with, I put online. Um, and usually first, when I meet a horse, if the horse has got um, schooling, um, or is, or let's say, been handled enough, I'll put them online and um, then work them in hand. Um, and online, so they know that they can move and, and they know they can run if they feel like they need to run. They know we start a conversation online. And we do lots of transitions from walk to trot to canter to trot to walk to trot to canter to up and down. And we change directions gently and softly. And then when a horse is um, able to relax and, and is starting to focus, then we work in hand. And that might take... Um, anywhere from several minutes to the bigger part of the lesson. So we progress by you know, teaching the horse about um, relaxing its jaw in hand, um, relaxing the pole in hand, releasing its neck longitudinally and laterally, and, um, and then releasing the shoulders laterally, releasing the hind leg laterally so that they learn to engage. And so um, learn to relax through their skeleton, through their back, through their hips, through their pelvis, through their neck, thoracic spine. Um, pole is a critical place so we can, you know, ask a horse and suggest to the horse to release the pole laterally. Just very soft little releases which will grow into huge releases later on. Um, first a little bit at halt and then in motion. Can they release in motion in hand? They haven't got the weight of the rider. They haven't got the worry of the rider. Um, they haven't got the worry about what's going to happen when there's somebody on their back. And if they got worried, you could just let them deflect around you. And when they got all settled back down again, you could start again. Represent. <laughs> yep. And just you know, your horse is going to come back to you if you if you don't put them in a, in a bind. So um, there's so many things we could talk for hours and hours and hours about those things. But there's um, you know, suffice it to say, there are progressions, and they should be rational and calm progressions from online for the you know the average horse. If they're novice horse, they don't have little connection, we might go into the round bed or we might walk alongside them or, you know, um, have a couple of people to help um, so that it, the requests are clear. And that's really what we're trying to do is make everything easy for a horse to learn 
make the requests clear so that the horse doesn't have to guess and the horse doesn't have to worry. If we can get that layered in in the beginning, then progressions for our horse will generally go fairly smooth through our lessons and our in our day-to-day -day connection. Mm -hmm. So presenting the question in a way that the horse can just say yes. It sounds like slow and right beats fast and wrong. Yeah, always, 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 always. And I would, I would much prefer to, you know, err on maybe going too slow, and my horse going ho hum. I, I think I'm okay with this. And when they ho hum enough, we can say, oh, maybe we can move this up. But rather than get in and, and move too quickly and have my horse be worried about it, um, much much better for for um, my horses and the people I teach to just slow it all down and and listen to what your horse says. I hear you. And there there are some questions, um, Mark, that are maybe a tad bit more technical, but you could probably speak to these as well since we're kind of talking about that right now. Um, there's questions. Uh, Carol must have been at that Arizona clinic. You must have just come back from there because you look kind of tan. <laughs> <laughs> it's good coloration for my camera. <laughs> it is. I, it, yeah, I need to work on that. Anyway, uh, so Carol says that um, you mentioned three things that disengagement does to the horse. Can you please state these again? Uh, for me, um, disengagement um, as, a, as a general consensus um, we'll hyperflex the joints in the hind leg, which is really not a not a good thing to do. Um, and it takes the forward out of the horse. Um, it, and we see people disengage uh, a great deal. Um, it's one way that people think they're safe, but if we don't have forward in a horse, and I don't mean the horse running away, I mean the ability to access um, trans, upward transition in a horse, if we disengage them um, constantly, then they feel like they can't go anywhere. But it puts them on their forehand as well. So we're, we're constantly, in my world, I want my horses to engage, not disengage. Disengagement for me is about, you know, saving your life or your horse's life. It only takes a very short while to teach a horse to disengage because they do it in play all the time if they have that opportunity. And then the rest of the horse's life, I want them to engage. I don't want to put them on their forehand by disengaging them. I don't want to hyperflex their hind leg joints. And, uh, you know, um, and it takes away a, a, the ability for the horse to go forward. So... Those three things are three of the worst things I can think of that we can do to our horses because now we're into, you know, physical discomfort and emotional discomfort all under the guise of something that we think is absolutely necessary as a constant. So, so you're not saying don't teach it. You're saying don't drill it. Don't drill it. Don't drill it. You know, when your horse understands disengagement, then teach them to engage as a constant. And then they'll start to balance towards the haunch and they'll stay off of their forehand and, and we don't have to do so many um, huge rain aids to get them to move. Got it. So Allah would like to know if you can share some exercises um, and, uh, that help to supple the horse's spine and hindquarters. Uh, yeah, um, certainly circles um, are one of the great um, exercises. And one of my constant questions with people is, can you ride a circle? And everybody says, yes, I've been riding circles all my life. And I say, I've been riding circles all my life, and I hope before I die I get a, a good circle. Because most circles aren't circles, but if we can ride a perfect circle, then our horse's spine will be supple and they'll be engaged and they'll be balanced. The perfect circle takes forever to learn to do and then to present. But that's one of the movements that we would practice. Um, the other movement is uh, spiraling circles, spiraling out circles to begin with will engage the hind leg um, and supple the spine. We, we would like to have 
Uh, when we spiral out, if we've done our in-hand work and done some work online, our horse is more prepared for that when we ride. Um, and we'd like to have the rib cage um, to the outside so that the spine is in the right position and the inside hind leg stepping forward and underneath the core of the horse, but not necessarily past the midline. Um, shoulder in is another great exercise. I use it as a engaging, relaxing, suppling exercise. It is one of the movements that I use as a constant in the beginning of my ride and fairly um, often as the last thing I do when I ride a horse. It's in relaxation so that the joints release. Um, then we can do a counter shoulder in, which is another exercise for the front end. Um, another exercise that we introduce in hand is teaching the horse to lengthen their neck and relax their neck um, laterally and longitudinally into the bend. So if the horse is bent left, um, telescoping the neck out and to the left to a very um, slight degree. We never really need the horse's neck beyond the point of the interior shoulder. So um, those are just pieces. Um, Can you all say that again? What is that? Say that again. We never say it again. <laughs> never really need the horse's neck to bend beyond the point of the interior shoulder. So we see big bends in horses and people doing lots of hyperflexion, but it doesn't connect the horse um, well um, proprioceptively. So it actually throws a horse out of balance and makes their back stiff. Mm. So then they'll okay. get nervous and then we build in a bother. <laughs> you know? Got it. Yeah, I've done that enough. Okay. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> <It's coming>. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that little information. <laughs> um, so, let, you know, talking about building in a bother, um, what are your thoughts on um, bits and spurs and whips and things of that nature that we see so so often in, in the dressage world? Well, in the world. In the world. I think um, that's a, a great question. I think that... Um, the beginning of, of developing our horses, when we think of bits to create pressure so that our horse um, um, will respond, I think that the bits that I use are very simple. I use um, bozals sometimes when I start horses. I use rope halters when I start horses, and I use predominantly the majority of my beginning training is in simple snaffles, full cheek snaffles, um, or ring snaffles, whatever, depending on the ability of the horse, the, the lightness of the horse to the bridle. Some of that's genetic, and some of that's what we layer in, some of that's biomechanic alignments. Um, whatever bit um, the horse responds well to, if the horse is a little bit um, out of balance laterally, full cheek bits or snaffles are a good choice. And as they get um, little, uh, somewhat educated, we can go to a, a different ring. That's, for me, not a, overly relevant, as long as we have it set up so we don't pull the ring into the horse's mouth. Um, uh, spurs, I think, um, I think they're a tool. I think that most people that I have seen in my life don't have any idea what a spur is there for um, or could be there for. It's a very good academic tool when a horse is ready for it. Um, it helps the horse to lift. It helps timing of the horse. It helps the horse to perhaps bend, but we already have those things layered in long before we um, touch with a spur. If we have the, the, a high degree of tact, um, then we can use a spur on a nervous horse actually to help them quiet and relax, but that's a study in and of itself. Um, so I think they're a good tool if they're used wisely and well and, and not as a tool of force. Anytime we use it as a tool of force, then it becomes a bad tool. 
The same with whips. Whips for me are extensions of my aids. They're never there to um, intimidate a horse or um, whip a horse or spank a horse with. They're always there to touch, um, to energize, to focus, to align. And if we take them out of that realm and we use them to whip our horse, um, then it's a bad tool. Simple. Simple, simple. <laughs> Got it. Great. Um, so, or there's, um, I have a question, but there's a, there's a question from um, Susan who has a Tennessee walker. She has a five-year-old mare. And she's just wondering how successful can a Tennessee walker be in dressage? As long as, if it's a gated horse, it needs to be a gated dressage class, but I think they, they're they no different than any other horse. If we're um, progressive and we teach them how to use their body and how to use their, how to use their joints and how to engage, um, and how to bascule in the spine and in the neck and in the haunch, which is gymnastic progression, then they can be, you know, highly successful in gated horse dressage. Um, you know, I ride lots and lots of gated horses in um, art form dressage. And it just it truly makes them um, actually easier to adjust so we can create gait and it creates um, a horse that's very happy and healthy and sound. So um, I think certainly gated horses in dressage are a very viable entity. And it sounds to me, Mark, like the, the, the presiding theme is once we have a horse that's relaxed and confident and not afraid and we've you know not built in too many braces and we've you know not gotten them too concerned about things that all things are possible. Uh, yes, and and the other thing we that I think about and I see a lot of is biomechanic misalignment, spinal misalignment, you know, um, ventral flexation of the dorsal spine, um, thoracic um, spine locking up, um, lumbar sacral, which is the weakest part of the skeleton, um, but one of the most important. Um, that gets out of alignment, um, hips that get out of alignment, and rotation of hind legs. Certainly all of those things, biomechanic alignments, are critical to the horse's ability to um, not only move and perform to the best of their ability, but also to carry a human and perform to the best of their ability. If they're biomechanically not um, aligned, they aren't going to do that job well, and they aren't going to necessarily stay sound or healthy. And are you saying that can happen through ground exercises and riding, or are we talking about chiropractic adjustment or all of the above? I would say, I would say we can, we can um, keep a horse biomechanically aligned the more we understand how important it is, and the more we understand what we're looking for, it's not difficult to keep them biomechanically aligned so that they engage and they lift the core and lift the spine or bascule the spine. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's hard to do. I think it's that people are informed that, one, it's necessary or that it's um, something that they can do as a rider, teacher, trainer. Yeah, probably the answer is come take the clinic and <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> Uh, you know, they have to understand that it's important, and then the, the learning process is about how to create good alignments. Um, and without good alignments, you aren't going to have the best horse that your horse could be, simply. Right. Makes perfect sense. Um, so I read a bunch of articles that you wrote uh, for the PRE magazine. Um, am I correct in uh, in saying that you have a special affinity for the Baroque courses? <laughs> I do. I really do. I think that, um, I don't think they're a horse for everyone, um, but if you enjoy um, um, fluid movement and um, high energy and activity um, and 
you you are um, able to understand how to direct that without blocking it and how to develop it. Um, I um, I would say everybody should have at least all oh, three or four. You know, <laughs> that's what I'd say. But I say it's not for everybody because some people are frightened by the movement and the activity. They're not shut down. They're not. You know, they can step on your toe ten times before you know they stepped on your toe the first time. So it's not for everyone. Mm. But as we advance and if we learn how to utilize it and, and how to develop them, yeah, I think they're a lot of fun. It's like having a Ferrari in your backyard without having to put fuel in it. <laughs> wow. And I I actually have a, a PRE, and uh, he he is the boldest Taurus I've, I've ever known. And he's also, there's a there's really something different about, there's there, I mean, right from the time he was a baby, I met him when he was four months old, uh, there was a ancientness about him. I don't even know what to say to that, but it's not a quarter horse. It's not a thoroughbred. It's not a standard bred. It's not, you know, exactly. the... Yeah, something really different. Something very, very different. <clears throat> He's coming. We have to be able to, to connect with that and and um, have some understanding of it. Um, it's not easy um, if you desired to have them shut down because you desired to have one that was shut down. It's very. It's not easy to do, and I would recommend against it. <laughs> I would ride the vibrancy of the breed because of the vibrancy of the breed. It's hundreds, if not thousands, of years old, um, and they're very human connected. All of mine meet me at the gate every day. Other ones will eat grass. They'll run across the pasture to meet me at the gate. So they work harder than the rest of them. So it's it, it's what I enjoy in a horse. I had someone uh, who who trains um, operant conditioning with with horses. She's a she's a gal who uh, she said that the Andalusians are like the border collies of the dog world. Yeah, yeah they really are. They really are. They, you want to have a, a good job for them and keep them um, biomechanically aligned because when they go out, you know, it, it's like your car going down the highway. And, 85 miles an hour out of alignment, you know, so you want to be careful with that as well, so because of their energy. I wonder if you uh, have any anything you'd like to say about stallions, keeping stallions, riding stallions. Um, I, I, you know, worldwide or? <laughs> yeah, well, I think per that, personal, personal advice for somebody who's got one. <laughs> <laughs> My thought about stallions is if you if you have a and it's a subjective thing and I'll tell you what I heard many many years ago if my stallion acts like a gelding I'll keep him around if he acts like a stallion I'll castrate him and so um, if their breeding is uh, comparable um, I would say if, if there's too many stallions in the world for my take on it um, there are too many. Um, not good stallions in the world. Um, I don't have a stallion. I've had stallions, but they're really easy to castrate. You just call your local veterinarian and have them come over and castrate. And um, and I would recommend that you do it as quickly as possible. <laughs> so, but if you've got a good stallion and he's a viable um, breeding animal, um, in in their in their good minded and confirmationally well built and superior in most all respects. Well, have at it. Have at it. You know, the rest of them make really nice geldings. <laughs> As they say, if you have a a good stallion, I'll make a great gelding. Yeah, it's just a step down stallion anyway. So. <laughs> Um, so I have a bunch more questions that are coming. So let me just take a look at these questions. Um, is there a, is there a a common thing that you find that students who first start learning from you uh, misunderstand or don't understand or get wrong? This is a question from Monica. Yes, I I find that as a constant. Um, a lot of it's about language, but a lot of it's um, about um, relearning um, 
truly about the horse. And um, a lot of people that I that I um, teach that stay with me to learn um, basically um, are taught that they have to make their horse do things, that they have to be um, stronger, they have to be, they have to have training accessories that will force the horse to do things. And for me, there's nothing further from the truth. Um, when we start to communicate and teach rather than to make, then we're on a better path for the horse. And then there's language and, and gymnastics, why we do what we do. And it's always to help our horse develop um, flexibility and balance and straightness and lift. Um, so it, in our, I can say this, in my lifetime, I am still amazed at the things a horse can do for you if they're well prepared and, and well developed. Um, and to this day, I, I would bet I can go out on my own horses and they'll teach me something new about how finite that can be. Yeah, I hear you. So inside, let's just talk for uh, the next, we have about um, five minutes left of our time together, and I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about your clinics, your format. Um, I, You know, Hila and I have worked out an opportunity for you to come and be with us here in New Jersey in October. I'm going to actually display a little sticky note over here um, for you guys, I think. I'm going to be able to do that and um, so you can see it. Um, so um, what what are the prerequisites? I mean, what should people expect? Should we all be reading your books before we come and watching your DVD? And um, tell me. I would always say they should read, read my books and watch the DVD. And I think it, what it does is it um, gives you a window into some of the things we're going to talk about and, and some of the things we're going to present. Um, and as we understand language and as we understand why we do what we do um, and some of how we present it and how we do what we do, um, then when you come you won't be in total shock. <laughs> and you know it's just it's a it's a different it's a different way of talking about the horse. It's for the horse, pieces and parts of it you have heard before, um, pieces and parts of it you may have seen before, but we'll present it for each individual and each horse um, exactly where they are in their journey. Um, it matters not what horse you ride. It matters not what uh, discipline you ride in. Um, every horse that I've seen, we've been able to help. Um, so um, I wouldn't be afraid because you don't understand language, you don't understand um, dressage or, or natural horsemanship. If you have things you're curious about or worried about or thinking about, come, you'll learn. There's, there is no doubt in my mind. And it will be about you and the horse. Um, rather than something else, so that you and your horse get a better connection. So from what I understand, the format are the, the ones that I've looked at. The format looks like you work individually with people and their horses, so maybe a horse and then maybe a human. Or how, Can you say more about that? Yeah, most of the, most of the clinics that we do, it, it's a one-on-one -on -one format. Um, one, because, you know, um, getting the horse in the right in the right postures, in the right frame of mind, then um, as the owner, rider, teacher um, starts to see that, starts to understand that to some degree, um, then we'll get them connected again because it'll be, there's a, there's a learning curve for the horse and the rider in those formats. Um, so the horse has to understand it. And I always say if I can get the horse um, successful, I can always get the rider successful. If the horse isn't successful and the rider isn't successful, we don't really have a good combination to, to work on. So that's basically why it's a one-on-one -on -one scenario most of the time. You know, I have to say, when I first started thinking about 
hosting and and what that would be like, I I was thinking, gosh, you know, well, what is everybody else going to do all day long while you're, you know, only working with a person or and their horse for an hour? But I can see after this conversation how really dynamic it could be. You know, you could really learn a lot by watching every combination of yes. you and every horse and every horse and human combination. And and for someone like myself who has a whole herd of horses, you know, they're all different. Yeah, you can't go out and play with your horse while you've got a fresh thought. You know, if there's room, you can always go and play with your horse out in the outdoor space or whatever it is, you know, or go play with your horse in the stall or, you know. Well, fortunately, oh. the, the space that we have um, booked is a, is a lovely, there's a lovely outdoor and there's a brand new indoor that's just just in the early stages right now, so it's going to be a lovely brand new place for us. And there's uh, so the, and there's big giant pastures and lots of grass and all kinds of lovely things. So it, it's a level it'll be a lovely spot in the world. And it's down there in South Jersey, so it's it's way down at the bottom of South Jersey. So if you guys can see, I've I've added a little um, I've added a little pop in to the to the sidebar and that I'm interested button. If you just press on that, it just takes you to the contact page on my website, and you could just send me an email and say and ask questions or say you're interested. And um, soon we'll start taking deposits, um, so we can actually hold the space and hold Mark's time. Um, so it is October 10th, 11th, and 12th. So if anybody's interested in traveling to New Jersey. Um, there's places to keep your horse, and like I said, there's indoor spaces and outdoor spaces, and lots of room for you. There's not any real place to hook up your trailer if you have like a living quarters trailer if you wanted to stay for a few days, um, but there's certainly there's certainly parking spaces for your trailer, so so that works pretty well. And there's lots of lots of ease to hotels and highways and and those kinds of things. So we'd be happy to help you out with all of that. So I guess I guess for now, Mark. I guess we're, our time is up. It's seven o two. So that that was an hour that went quickly. We we certainly had some questions left that we didn't get to. I have really really enjoyed um, being able to spend this time talking with you, and I look forward to furthering our relationship and really talking with you about some some other things. And maybe we'll get to do this again, you know, in a couple of months, and and uh, maybe get to answer some more of those questions and expand on some of those things that people really want to know. Excellent, and it's been a joy. I can't wait to get to your place, and please, everybody that can, come out. There's lots to learn. Yeah, there's no doubt. So, so Mark Russell, thank you so much. Um, and I, people can certainly find you on the web at um, it's natural dressage. Mark Russell, natural dressage. That's the that's the Google criteria that I've been finding you at. So it's easy enough to find you there. And your your book, Lessons in Lightness. I look forward to that. And I, I appreciate your guys coming to uh, participate in our webinar today. This is a joy for me because I get to, uh, my goal is really just to make the world a better place for horses. And, you know, I think that, um, that there's a lot of people that can help and there's a lot of people that are in a lot of different places. And I think we need to kind of come to the middle somehow and meet people where they are and, and really help make a difference, you know, have more relaxed horses, have more balanced horses, have more horses that are going to have longer useful lives, you know, and, and really able to um, be our partners for a really long time. And if for whatever reason they can't stay with us, they're going to be valuable to somebody. So that that's that's my intention and goal. So Mark Russell, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Marianne. And, and I've enjoyed it immensely. And I hope everybody else got a lot out of our discussion. And I look forward to future discussions. Great, and we'll we'll follow you on Facebook, and you guys can follow us on Facebook, and uh, that's a that's a fun place to get to know people. That's how I found out about Mark, so that's a fun place to get to know people. So, all right, everyone, have a great evening, Mark. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Marianne. Good night. Bye bye.